Uh, I'm about to introduce to you someone that we've all been waiting to hear from for some time, my dear friend, uh, Michael uh, K. Powell, who is the president and chief executive officer of NCTA, the Internet and Television Association. And so we're going to get just right into this discussion uh, in, in the green room. Uh, Michael and I have had a chance to catch up, so we're not going to bore you with, with our, uh, our heydays from, uh, from 20 years ago. But uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's great to see you, Clint. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, you know, many Americans describe 2020 as, as in the history books or as somehow behind us, but it really isn't. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is still raging and, and millions of Americans remain out of work and are struggling. Uh, we recently witnessed a deadly insurrection at the United States Capitol this month. And, and despite the broadening of the coalition that powers the social justice movement um, that has really captured the imagination of the American public since George Floyd's murder, we continue to suffer the loss of black lives at nearly the same numbers in 2020 as we saw in 2019. Uh, so over the years, but especially the last two, you've spoken so eloquently Michael, uh, about the need for business leaders to stand and to stand for their black employees and to stand for their black customers to push back against uh, racism. Uh, what are the challenges that you see for the country writ, writ large uh, post uh, January 6th? Well, that's a challenging question. You know, there's a, a, a Buddhist proverb I'm fond of, which says everyone you see is suffering. And I think it's a statement of humility to recognize the concerns of your fellow citizens, but no time have I ever experienced such a perfect storm of such widespread challenge and suffering. We have a global pandemic, we have uh, uh, economic harm, uh, and we have the continuing unfinished problems of racial strife in America, all of which I think uh, are the focus of business and the focus of policy leaders rightfully. And if you were to add to that, we have a fraying democracy who, whose repair is essentially critical to addressing any of the other challenges that we're facing. So, you know, to, to, to quote that wonderful young poet laureate, Amanda Gorman, you know, the hill we climb is high. Uh, and I think it's important as we talk about the internet and its outsized role and its outsized responsibilities in this moment is important. Uh, clearly, it's also it's part of the negative as well as the positive. I mean, I think the society will have very, very challenging and difficult questions over the coming years about degree to which the platforms contribute to the negativity that we're trying to reconcile. You know, the founding fathers were concerned principally about mobs, factions, and autocrats, and and they were really thoughtful about that and needing to design checks and balances for the system they were putting in place. And I fear that. We didn't give enough consideration to those risks when we designed the, the technological platforms that so many of us interact with today. And now we're playing kind of a degree of catch up um, to address that, which will be challenging. On the positive, you know, um, not only has technology come to the rescue, I don't think we would have as an effective response uh, or even be in a position to respond to the health and economic crisis without the ability to hand public health officials the ability to keep keep Americans home from work. Um, that's a result of years of investment and enlightened policy around broadband deployment. Um, I think we can be proud that um, the network held up to that challenge. Uh, many in our industry worked really hard to keep Americans connected. And I think it shined a bright, bright light on the continuing unfinished work of getting low income citizens on the network um, and to help our students who who really are going through a horrendous time trying to adapt to the remote learning challenges that I know many of the former panelists were talking about. So it is a very high hill to climb. I think we all have a social responsibility to do so, not just a commercial responsibility to do so. Uh, and I know that's gonna be the focus uh, of a lot of our work as we go into 2021. Michael, you, you may have been a little modest in describing the role that the broadband industry has, has played you know, during this pandemic. Uh, in, in fact, the, the industry has been a central figure to, to powering uh, during the pandemic and is going to be very important, uh, obviously, to its recovery. Um, you know, we've been involved in these debates for many years over whether broadband is essential, a necessity, a nicety, or, or even a civil right. 
but, but no one can discount um, the importance. Uh, and, and the industry's commitment that you re referred to uh, it has been really laudable uh, to keep people connected to the internet uh, and, 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 and has been rightfully praised, but, but can't continue in perpetuity. Uh, ad hoc congressional responses to keep Americans connected are, well, well they're ad hoc. Uh, we have a near evenly split Congress and a new administration focused on COVID relief and, and economic recovery. Where is the cable broadband industry going to be focused in 2021? And are you concerned that some of these secular trends that I've described could stall the industry's strong growth performance uh, in, in, in the next few quarters or, or out further in the future? Yeah, well, to start maybe where you began, Clint, um, you know, I'm somewhat humored by which adjectives we choose to describe the essential nature of the internet, but Needless to say, it's, it's highly critical and important to many of our ambitions as a country and in resolving the most profound harms facing our country. So I can tell you in our industry and our CEOs fully embrace the centrality and the importance of the service they work hard to provide toward greater ends than just commercial success. And I think that's important. Um, you know, unfortunately policy sometimes collapses importance with loaded concepts like utility. You, you know, somehow importance equals utility, but there are many, many important things in the world that are not utilities and are effectively harnessed for the public good without um, um, some of the onerous past that uh, utility language suggests. But so putting that aside, I mean, I think one of the things we've talked about as an industry, I remember in, you know, very clearly on March 13th when we locked down um, and in the following weeks, we had calls with the CEOs. Um, and, and I was less than melodramatic in saying to the, to the industry that uh, not unlike Churchill on the eve of London bombings, this needs to be your finest hour. Uh, this needs to be the moment where you're, you're not quibbling or renegotiating or debating about the importance of helping keep our society connected. We have to, we have to run to the challenge as aggressively as we can. And while we were not perfect, I think we did a lot more than some people expected we would. And I think we were proud of what we were able to help the country through. And I think that that spirit, we're gonna carry forward uh, into 2021. I think we're gonna do well in the markets because we're gonna do well by doing good. I mean, at our core, we're in the connection business. Um, and it's, it's essential that we not fear a robust policy discussion about getting more people connected. This should be a universally shared goal. Uh, it should avoid partisanship uh, and it should avoid the tiresome categorizations of corporations as adversarial to the interests of the public good, which too often dominate these conversations. If we can't find a way to be in partnership and in communion with the government and the private sector to solve these problems, I assure you they, they won't be solved. We'll be talking about this again in three years and five years and 10 years. Um, but the moment presents itself, and I think we, we want to step up to that. Um, I also think that we, we are a product of really smart decisions. You know, our networks get build, built basically 18 to two years ahead of demand. Um, those kinds of engineering choices is why the network could perform so well in a crisis that accelerated that demand. We were already ahead of that curve. Um, and we're trying to get ahead of that curve for what we think is the next great generation of infrastructure. You hear a lot of the wireless industry talk about 5G, which I think is really important, but the country needs both the fixed network and the wireless network to really go to a new generation of capacity and capability. And for us, we, for us that's 10G, which is building toward a network that will have 10 gigabit capacity uh, for all Americans, not some, as all of them ultimately. And so our industry is continuing to follow the journey that it set out last year toward that goal. We've already reached gigabit speeds in basically our entire footprint more or less. Uh, and we're quickly moving toward uh, accelerating to greater speeds. So I think that's gonna be our focus in, in business and in infrastructure construction. Um, and I think we're gonna be a willing partner and dare say leader in conversations about how to get more of our citizens on the product we build in a safe uh, and effective way. Just as an add-on to this question, um, the 
relationship between wireless and cable, you know, has been variously characterized as competitive, you know, collaborative. You know, there have been some great partnerships that have come out of uh, these two industries, especially with 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 respect to bundling services. Uh, do, do you believe that this will continue as a, a collaborative um, arrangement uh, in the era of 5G, or, or do you think that there will be a divergence uh, and, and more intense competition between these, these two segments of the, the broadband industry? Well, there certainly will be reinvigorated competitive animal spirits, which I think is good. Um, you know, I continue to be frustrated that we tend to talk about these two networks in silos. Um, even under FCC policy today, they don't recognize wireless as a competitive alternative of, of broadband service, which is flabbergasting to me when, it, when it's inconsistent with the way consumers actually use the internet. Um, and if there was ever any doubt about it, I think the speeds and capabilities of 5G put that to rest. And certainly the industry is promoting uh, a, a, its vision of being a competitive alternative to the fixed network to some degree. So we have to recognize that it'll be reinvigorated competition, which I think is positive. Um, at the same time, the word I like to use, Clint, is symbiotic. I, I think people sometimes think these networks somehow are entirely different, that they, they are mutually interdependent and, and largely can't survive without the other you know, a very high percentage of wireless traffic is put into the ground very quickly. Vast majority of wireless traffic at home goes through Wi-Fi, which then goes over fixed networks. Um, they need each other in an essential way. And I think healthy policy would stop treating them kind of incongruently as separate, but would understand that the nation's goal is a symbiotic, seamless network of high capability. You know, our citizens, our neighbors, our friends, our children, don't want to and don't care about the difference of the networks. They, they want to seamlessly move back and forth between one and the other without having to give much forethought to, to logging out and signing back on and switching and, and, and being cognizant. And in fact, we have a degree of that right now. Most people who are on Wi-Fi uh, on their phones don't really give any thought to whether they're on a fixed network or they're on, or, or they're on their cell service. Um, and I think that's something we want to have them have, greater simplicity, uh, less transaction costs from moving from network to network. So I think policy has a way to go to harmonize the way it looks at networks and its network ambitions to see these things as an integrated whole um, and to allow them to compete, but understand they are symbiotic for the national interest. And we would be lesser of a country if we get to 10G and there's no 5G and I think we would be lesser if we got to 5G without 10G. We need policies that encourage the iterative growth of both of them. Um, and if we do that, I think we're going to be proud of what we have in, in, in the next five to 10 years. Uh, if we don't, we could create the same kind of balkanized kind of stovepipe um, that the 1996 Act still represents, which I think creates lots of, 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 of unnecessary hurdles. Well, all the references to G's made, made me think of uh, low income Americans right now who are suffering and the fact that they need 2G right now uh, in the COVID relief bill. So let's hope that uh, that doesn't stall in, in the United States Senate. Uh, on to one of our favorite topics, Mr. Chairman, uh, the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, you, you served nearly eight years on the commission over two different presidential administrations. I, I, I believe two, my goodness. Might, might, have been, might have been more. Um, but the, the current FCC is deadlocked with four to four uh, with our friend Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel serving as the acting chair. Yeah. Um, no doubt deals could approach this commission. Major rulemakings and remands could reach the commission this year. What advice would you offer to your former colleagues at the FCC as, as how they should operate in this divided state and, and even after the commission is functioning at full strength? Well, um, first of all, I would like to publicly congratulate Jessica Rosenworcel uh, on becoming acting chairwoman. She has been in the space a long time. Uh, I even tried to hire her once when I was chair of the FCC. She thought better of it. I wish I had convinced her, um, but I've watched her career for a long time. Um, and uh, I'm excited about her, her leadership. Um, 
I think the thing that I would say, Clint, you know, I, I had brief periods where there was 2-2 two -two, um, or we had 2-2 two -two because somebody was recused. I think the greatest advice I could give is that this is a special moment, not, not a moment of, of difficulty, but a moment of opportunity because it is the moment you can work on building a bipartisan relationship with each other. This is a moment where both of your various constituencies recognize there's a deadlock. And so the pressures are less on you than they might be if you had a clear, unflinching minor majority. And it's a real precious opportunity to build deeper relationships with your colleagues, recognize the mutual dependence of each other, uh, and actually try to build those bonds and nurture them for tougher issues to come down the line uh, while you have the luxury uh, uh, of the situation. Um, I think it is a mistake to just sit back and say, well, we won't do anything until we get more commissioners. Uh, uh, that's a politicized response. Uh, I, I think the judicious response of, of an expert agency should be, uh, we will just work harder to get bipartisan consensus to do things. Um, and rather than sort of be on hiatus for the next two months, uh, let's try to do something together. Um, and I think that could be uh, a kind of first step uh, toward, toward a healthy and functioning commission who has really grave issues to, to address. So that would be my advice. Um, I, I think there's been a trend of politicizing the FCC uh, over the decades since I was there that I regret. I don't think it's healthy. I think it's independent for a reason. I think it's uh, technocratic for a reason. And I think they are at their best when they're acting more as jurists than many politicians. Um, and I would hope that they would try to set a new tone uh, along those lines. Um, and I think that they will serve themselves well and the public they serve if they do. Well, I, I hope uh, your words you know, land. Uh, one of the things that I remember from the time we served together at the commission uh, was that you, you were very much, even as a commissioner, uh, someone who always would push back when the agency seemed to be veering into political realms. Uh, your, your fierce defense of the independence of the agency was on full display even before you ascended um, you know, to the chairmanship. But I mean, in, in some ways, even if it's latent, the commission has begun to reflect the polarization that we've seen in the Senate and, and the Congress that sends these people, um, you know, to the agency. Uh, you know, you were appointed by uh, a Democratic, uh, a Democratic president and a Republican president. Um, the, the there are folks who may share that history with you, but they aren't behaving necessarily with the same type of independence. Um, uh, that, that we saw, you know, in the, in the early part of, of, of this century, uh, especially during, during your chairmanship and later. How do we get back to that, Michael? Well, you know, Clint, I think about this a little bit like where you started our conversation about the, the stunning events of the summer in the wake of George Floyd's murder. And I don't think as a citizen and as a human being, I've ever felt more pain in my adult life than I did in in, in that, in those summer months. Um, but one of the things that emerged from it was a reframing, sometimes referred to as anti-racism, sometimes described more around systematic racism. But one thing that I thought was positive that sort of got expelled forward is the sense that this is everybody's responsibility. This is every institution's responsibility. This is every uh, citizen's responsibility. They have to own their own universe of influence in the way that it contributes to the lack of progress on the unfinished work of this country to live up to its creed. And, 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 and we just had an attack on the United States Capitol. And I would say the same thing should be expelled from that experience, which is every single one of us has a responsibility to defuse the kind of vicious partisanship that has taken us to where we are. 
And, and maybe it doesn't seem like that if you're just a commissioner at the FCC, but of course it does. We, we all can either contribute to the divisions and the polarizations, or we can all choose to stand and contribute to doing it a different way, um, to disagree respectfully, to, to look for that common ground, to not demonize, to not you know, pick up shallow uh, issues because your, your base will like it, but it isn't good policy. Um, if, the, if independence means anything to the commission, they should wrap themselves up in that privilege as forcefully as they can. And, and sort of stand against that tendency to believe that, hey, I'm actually a, a junior congressperson with a constituency. No, you're not. You're not elected by any people. You're appointed and granted a very special regulatory model in order to act solely in the public interest without malice to anyone. And so I guess I'll just leave it there. If we're all supposed to be anti-racist, then I think we all are supposed to understand our responsibility in a world of divisiveness and stop and do everything in our zone of influence to stop it. Um, that's Democrat and Republican alike. And I think the president um, to his great credit struck that tone of unification in the beautiful remarks during inauguration. And I hope we all really don't forget it and live by it. That's, that's the best I think we can do as human beings. Michael, I, I know we're wrapping uh, pretty soon, but I, I just want to say as a, someone who's known you for a long time and known your family, you know, uh, your, your mother uh, grew up in Alabama and, and knew the little girls at the, at the 16th Street Baptist Church who were killed. You know, your father and his long career in the military had to face uh, horrendous uh, challenges uh, around racism. And, and you are a, a wonderful product uh, of those two people. And, uh, and I just appreciate the the statesmanship and the eloquence with which you, you talk about these issues. Uh, I, don't know if you wanna, I don't know if you want to break any news here, uh, Mr. Chairman, about uh, any of your future plans uh, to run for the United States Senate or, or Congress, but we're, we're, we're all ears. Um, you know, there's some, there's some packed people on, on, online, I can see among the participants. We, we, we want to know, is this, is this going to happen, Mr. Chairman? I'm just a cable guy. That's all I am right now. <laughs> Thank you, though. This, is, this has been a lot of fun, and, uh, and I hope uh, the friends uh, out there watching uh, can appreciate what, what a special person you are and what, a, what a, a special time this is and the events that seem exogenous to our business are not. Uh, as you've said, justice is the business of business, and, uh, and I, hope, I hope people take that and those words to heart. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.